The very first article and the very first comma of the first article in the FAO Constitution requires that FAO provides data and information. So the mandate, the foundational mandate of the organization was to collect, analyze, interpret and disseminate information relating to nutrition, food and agriculture. So it's not something of recent interest, is there since the foundation in 1940. This uh, quote is from a report that was published in 2012, which stressed the fact that the, the while, despite being the most widely cited measures, the prevalence of undernourishment, which are the hunger numbers in which FAO every year <coughs> produces a hunger map, publishes a state of food insecurity in the world publication, are still problematic because they give no sense of the severity of hunger. They cannot be used to understand within a country what are the differences between different regions, different provinces, and whether or not those who are undernourished are very deep into undernourishment. And this is a very uh, appropriate criticism leading to some of the uh, innovations that we will discuss later today. But there are other <coughs> criticisms, even raised at quite high level, with which I personally have a hard time relating to. This is, for example, a quote in Asia Development uh, by Bill Gates. When he, he said that we don't understand why FAO doesn't do what you might expect. Take a large sample of people and determine how many are eating enough. So why to have a statistical inferential model, a probabilistic parametric approach? Why? It's so easy. So one of the aim of this presentation today is to give you my uh, view <coughs> of why what seems to a person that is not particularly aware of some of the statistical problems related to the quality of data, why it's so difficult to do what uh, Mr. Gates would suggest we would do. And uh, so I would start by <coughs> listing what I call persistent needs on the FAO approach to measuring undernourishment. One is because it relies on food balancing data, FAO only measures food supply. And uh, by analyzing food supply, of course, you miss the issue of how the food is distributed in a population, and therefore the hunger numbers are imperfect. Well, that could have been true until 1974, when the main contribution of FAO to the World Food Survey publication was to make an assessment of the average uh, dietary energy supply in a country. But since 1974, since the fourth edition of the World Food Summit, and ever since 1985, 1996, and then every year 1990 on, FAO has published estimate of the prevalence of undernourishment that take into strong consideration the issue of the distribution of food in a country. So this myth should be debunked because it's no longer true. A second uh, myth is that the definition of undernourishment that is implicit in the FAO hunger number is too restrictive because it only focuses on dietary energy, calories. And uh, malnutrition is a broader concept, and uh, there are other forms of malnutrition other than caloric or uh, dietary energy inadequacy. True. This is absolutely true. But the point is that this was an indicator, a measure intended to measure hunger, not to measure <coughs> each and every form of malnutrition. And hunger, which is arguably the extreme form of malnutrition, is strongly associated with a deficit, an inadequacy of the 
that are the energy that is provided by food. So why it is true that maybe measuring hunger only does only a partial view of the malnutrition problem that exists. More so nowadays where probably people are claiming that the number of overweight and uh, obese people, that the incidence of non-communicable diseases related to the bad quality of the food, of the diet, it's even larger than the problem of hunger. It is true. So this is a good point. It should lead to expand our ways to measure and address malnutrition, but it's not necessarily a valid criticism of a method that was intended, designed to measure hunger and not other form of malnutrition. Uh, the third myth is that uh, because the prevalence of undernourishment uses a dietary energy requirement reference that is computed referring to a low physical activity level, it must be the case that FL measure fails to count those who are engaged in heavy physical work and therefore may be undernourished even if they eat relatively high level of calories. Now, if the FAO uh, methodology would fall into this mistake, that would be a big problem. The truth is that it does not. And uh, this consideration is the result of a superficial way of looking at the methodology. And uh, the fact that there is a parameter called the MDR in the methodology that is computed by referring to minimal uh, physical activity level doesn't imply that the method would consider all people that are eating less than the MDR as undernourished. And this is a the very delicate technical detail that I would like for a meeting like this one to finally and completely bring out and dispel of any concern. The conclusion of the various criticisms that have been raised against the FAO method and compared with the increasing availability of data from surveys, and as Vikas says, India is one of the leading countries in the conduction of household surveys, has led many people to say that indeed there must be better ways of measuring undernourishment using existing surveys. And I, I wish so, because my last five years of work has been an attempt at looking deeply, carefully into the quality and the type of the data that is collected in our survey to inform a better uh, measurement of hunger. And as far as food consumption data is concerned, I am afraid I couldn't find anything conceptually and uh, empirically better than the FAO methodology, but I'm very, very open to listen to alternative proposals if there are uh, any. There are other ways which steer a little bit away from the observation of food consumption and uh, observe, use data on other things. And the second part of the workshop in the afternoon will discuss the potential of using experience-based food security schemes, which rather than using information on what people eat, use information on whether or not some particular condition that are strongly associated with a situation of food insecurity have been occurring or not. And this is, for example, what in the United States is being used since 1995 regularly to monitor food insecurity. Even though, arguably, in the United States they have a very, a relatively easier job in collecting food consumption data because the vast uh, predominant method for acquiring food is through purchases. People, even in the rural areas, purchase most, most of their food. 
they have the possibility even of scanning the receipt of the supermarket or the food store. So one should wonder why in a country where food consumption data is of high quality, they use a different methods to <coughs> determine the extent of food insecurity. But we will touch on this uh, in the afternoon. Now, let's go back to the FAO undernourishment figure. And I would like to give you my view of a series of knowns and unknowns. Facts that we know and facts on which we have less information. Let's start with food balances. Aggregate food balances have been compiled by FAO and many countries for many years, and it's an interesting exercise which is useful for many, many, many reasons. Planning reasons, uh, allocation of uh, resources, deciding on uh, differential investment among sectors, and so on. But they can also provide <coughs> some interesting information for the food security situation. And I would say that we can estimate the trends in overall food supply reasonably well for most countries in the world. The methodology to combine the food balance sheet has been developed and improved over the years. It's a long established one. We have data on food production reported by the ministries of agriculture in most countries. We have data on food trade reported by the two partners in any trade. So there are ways in which we can use information to triangulate. triangulate. And uh, I think that overall, we, the conversation of the dietary energy supply is not relatively complicated by analyzing the primary commodity balances. And I would like to give you my view of a series of knowns and unknowns. Facts that we know and facts on which we have less information. Let's start with food balances. Aggregate food balances have been compiled by FAO and many countries for many years and it's an interesting exercise which is useful for many, many, many reasons planning reasons, uh, allocation of uh, resources, deciding on uh, differential investment among sectors, and so on. But they can also provide <coughs> some interesting information for the food security situation. And I would say that we can estimate the trends in overall food supply reasonably well for most countries in the world. The methodology to combine the food balance sheet has been developed and improved over the years. It's a long established one. We have data on food production reported by the ministries of agriculture in most countries. We have data on food trade reported by the two partners in any trade. So there are ways in which we can use information to triangulate. triangulate. And uh, I think that overall we the conversation of the dietary energy supply is not relatively complicated by analyzing the primary commodity balances. However, there are issues, and issues are, for example, on the data on the stocks. How much of the available supply in a given year is actually eaten by the uh, consumers, and how much instead is stored for the next year, or how much of the previous year's storage is used for current consumption, is the reason why FAO has always reported the estimate of the prevalence of undernourishment over a three-year period. FAO never reported an estimate of undernourishment in India in 2010. It was always an average of the 2009, 2011. 2010, 2015. The main reason for that is to account of the fact that there might be problems in monitoring correctly the changes in stocks. And the assumption is that by averaging over three years, then 
the errors due to this inability to monitor stock is smoothed out. There are problems with the extent of food waste and food losses, but I think that on these there are ways in which the supply limitation account can, if informed by people that have the information on the food system in a country, this could be uh, done quite reliably. The problem remains that the aggregate food supply doesn't give many insights on the potential spread of various forms of malnutrition. It's the old statistical problem that if we eat one chicken per capita, there will be people that eat two chickens and people that eat none. And so without an information on the distribution of the aggregate supply, the nutritional implication are difficult to, to address. Second area of data uh, that are relevant for undernutrition is the food consumption data. So, what do we know? Individual food consumption surveys and dietary assessment, the kind of uh, inquiries that the nutritionists usually do, in which they have an individual filling in 24-hour uh, records diaries of everything that has been eaten, possibly in two non-consecutive days, in order to be able to evaluate also the normal day-to-day -day variability, this could be used to inform an assessment of nutrient inadequacy, <coughs> including dietary energy inadequacy. And this is true. But these kind of assessments are extremely costly. You need a, a team of nutritionists that follows up with the uh, statisticians or that have designed the survey, and you have to interview a representative sample of individuals, so you cannot stop at the household level, you have to go beyond. And certainly it's impossible to think that large-scale, nationally representative dietary assessment surveys will be conducted every year in every country. It's simply impossible. You will be spending so much money that would probably over overcome, over uh, overweight the benefits. Uh, in countries like uh, the members of the European Union, for example, these kind of surveys are conducted once every ten years, and. Uh, that means that when they are available, you can definitely use them to calibrate and check an uh, assessment of uh, caloric inadequacy, but you cannot use them on a regular basis. Uh, again, dietary assessment are not the only source of food consumption data. There is an, a host of information collected through household consumption and expenditure service, household, household income service. And in fact, this is the main source of information on the distribution of access to food in a population that FAO has been relying on. Uh, nowadays, this kind of survey contains a fairly detailed list of food items and household reports for each item, the amount that has been acquired for home consumption <coughs> over a certain time period, and we use this information. But we have to keep in mind that the information contained in the economic aspect of food consumption, which is the acquisition of food as revealing part of the real income, real uh, spending power of a household is not exactly the nutritional information that we need. Because, for example, within a household, we don't know who eats what out of the existing household food supply. And uh, another point is that Data may refer to expenditure on food without detail of what is exactly 
been purchased. This is, for example, very common for food consumed away from home, in which we only have the restaurant bill or the result of how much was spent. And uh, the data may refer to the acquisition of food by the household over a certain reference period. But then, how much of that food was actually consumed by the members of the household over that period is often very difficult to ascertain. There may be part of this food that is given to workers. Uh, there is part of the food that household member gets outside of home, either at school or at work, without an explicit uh, expenditure that is not recorded. What does it mean, in short, is that while we can use household level food <coughs> consumption information, we have to be aware of the imprecision in the assessment of the individual food consumption that we would need for the assessment of whether or not a person is eating enough. And this is why the statement by Mr. Gates is nice but difficult in practice without strong statistical consideration. So, bottom line, a model-based inference is unavoidable when we don't have individual dietary intake data. Because we cannot match the level of individual dietary intake with the level of energy requirement. And this is the fundamental consideration that drives a separation between, for example, poverty assessment and nutrition assessment based on survey data. That while in a poverty assessment we can consider that $1.9 means the same thing to any individual in the population. The dollar is an external neutral metric. <coughs> the calorie is not because the dietary energy requirement is different for different individuals. There are the tiny people, those who work in less demanding activity that would need less calories of the big bodies, people engaged in uh, large physical activity. Adolescents who are growing need many more calories per kilogram of body mass than an adult that has reached the height. So all these considerations explain why an attempt of interpreting the FAO method to estimate the prevalence of undernourishment by referring to similar method for assessing poverty it's going to be mistaken. And I'm afraid that I have seen many, 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 many cases in which that mistake has been made. So the FAO method is actually a complex method. I have to agree that it's not easy to grasp. That uses different sources of data in a way that the different sources of data can also support each other, to, can reduce the probability of making big mistakes. And these are data on aggregate food balances. These are data on the demographic characteristic of the population, the distribution by sex, age, height, possibly, physical activity level, and distribution of food consumption. And the way this information is utilized is by controlling for the differences in sex, age, height, which is used as a proxy for the ideal body mass, and the physical activity level in the population. And this is necessary to control in order to avoid biases that will be induced by assuming that everyone that has reported a low level of caloric consumption is under nutrition. And everyone that has reported a high level of uh, dietary energy consumption is overnourished. Because that would mean that all children are undernourished, all 
the tallest people in the countries are always over -nourished. So it's how to match the observed dietary energy consumption with the requirement that is the challenge when you don't have individual level observation. And the, in, in principle, the method can be applied at any level, which means that whenever you have a population on which you have these three pieces of information, you can apply the FAO method. To the extreme, even a household is a population, is a group of people. And so the method could be applied also to establish whether a household as a whole, or what is the probability that a member of the household is undernourished. FL has traditionally applied the method at the national level. So we provide, we produce an estimate for a country. And this is problematic because in many cases the interesting information is within the country. I want to add on what Sharm said. There is a change between the MDG and the SDG process. The MDG process was mostly a debate on developing countries, ranking or judging the development level of a country versus another. So the unit of observation was a country. The SDG now have a rightful claim to be universal leave no one behind to be applied equally well at the developed and developing countries and to look at differences within the countries. So this is the main challenge that we have now, that the FAO method of estimating the prevalence of undernourishment needs to be applied <coughs> at sub-national level to provide information that is relevant for the uh, SDG monitoring. And for this, we need a concerted action in possibly improving the application of the method and the base of data to be able to do this assessment. So, now this second part of the presentation <coughs> intends to give a synthetic but complete view of what the method does. And starts by saying that uh, many in also personal communication have revealed that it's complicated, that people don't understand, it's difficult. And uh, one uh, implication of that is that may, very few countries have reported the prevalence of underinvestment using the FAO method, for example, to report on MDG progress, even though the prevalence of underinvestment was an official indicator for the MDG target 1.0. In many countries, there have been alternative <coughs> methods based on the prevalence of children who are underweight, which is also an official indicator of MDG1. It's uh, based on data that is collected by UNICEF and, uh, through the MIX survey. And uh, it's an indirect uh, measure of uh, hunger because if children reveal the sign of undernutrition, this means that the household has probably been in very difficult situation. So that was the rationale behind using children anthropometric measures as a measure of hunger. Uh, other countries, in other cases, have used methods based on household survey data that estimate the prevalence of dietary energy in adequacy. But I shall argue that these alternative methods are likely to be biased for a reason that I will explain in a short. And that the FL method is still the, at least theoretically, the proper way to proceed, even though there may be imprecisions or large margin of errors around the estimate due to the quality of the data that we use. Well, yes, this is a very simple formula, and uh, what it says is that if we could observe the data energy intake, which is called C for consumption, CI, and the requirement, R for requirement, uh, RI, 
for each individual in the sample, then the prevalence of under-evolution and estimate would be a simple method of counting. You classify each individual depending on whether or not Ci is less than Ri, and that is the formula. The formula sums all the individuals for which consumption is less than the requirement. You divide by the number of people in the sample and you have an estimate of the percentage of the people in the sample. The problem is that when you don't have individual consumption, so that, sorry, you don't have uh, individual consumption, yes, and individual requirement, you cannot do the matching. So if you don't know who is eating what, even though you have the information on how much food is consumed and who are the people in the group, it's impossible to do the match. And for this reason, it has been suggested that an alternative would be to use a similar formula with the difference that instead of using the individual requirement as a reference point, you use the average of the requirement of that group. So, the formula will be the same with the difference that you classify as undernourished those who have an estimated level of consumption less than the average requirement in the group. The difference between the two formula is that in the first case you have an individual requirement, R subscript I. In the second formula you have an average requirement, bar R. And now I claim this is wrong. Why? Imagine just a thought experiment that you have a group of people, each of them eating exactly what they need. Unless this is a group of identical people, there will be variation in the level of food intake. And 50% of them will be eating less than the average requirement in the group. For this reason, the second formula <coughs> is bound to give an overestimate of the probability of being undernourishment in the group to which it is applied. So, this is the big challenge. How to disentangle the variability that we can measure on food consumption in the two components? A variability that reflects the differences in the people. So, a normal diversity from the variability that is telling us something about the inequality, the fact that some people are not able to access the food they need. And I think that this is the reason why I'm teaching statistics, I'm into statistics, is because statistical science is what <coughs> equips us to make the difference between diversity, which is something that we should promote, we should defend, we should be proud of, and inequality, which is something that we should fight, we should <coughs> be against. So I'm Stopping with my original stand here, but I wanted to stress this difference that unfortunately when you only observe variability, there may be information on diversity and information on inequality. And we need to be aware of this because otherwise we might confound one for the other and pretend that everybody should be alike even in their better energy requirement, which is not true. So, one solution, and this is the solution that has been adopted by the FAO method, is to try and estimate what would be the variability requirement within this group and take that into consideration when drawing inference. In short, this is where the infamous MDER comes from, the minimum dietary energy requirement is not a normative statement that we only consider undernourished people who are engaged in, uh, sorry, that are eating less 
than what is needed to bear survive. No. The minimum dietary energy requirement is the parameter that takes into consideration the normal variability requirement that exists precisely because some people are engaged in heavy physical activity level and therefore they have higher requirement. Some people are of smaller stature and therefore they have lower energy requirement. There is a range of normal variability. The MPI is the lower bound of this range so that it's intended to protect against the overestimate I was referring to before. So how this concept is implemented in the FL method? The FL method defines a probability distribution model for the habitual food consumption of the average individual in the group. The average individual in the group is a fictional statistical character. Is a, an individual who's a man and a woman at the same time, has the entire distribution of age, the entire distribution of physical activity level, the entire distribution of height, is a statistical construct. What the distribution, the probability distribution tells is what is the probability of observing a certain level of food, habitual food consumption, regular food consumption, food consumption as the normal situation of this individual. And so each level will have a different probability, but you have to recognize that the range of variability is much narrower than the empirical distribution. Because the empirical distribution of food consumption in a population will have also very low level for infants, very high level for uh, ratio pullers or uh, heavyweight uh, lifters. So the empirical distribution of food consumption in a population, the one that you just draw as an histogram based on I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, my voice is... Uh, uh, that would be very wide. This distribution is normalized by the composition of the population, of the group. So it's much narrower. And uh, as I said, until now, for this average individual, there is not a single value of requirement, there is a whole range that reflects the variability that exists in all the characteristics that determine energy requirement that are consistent with adequate nutrition. And so we take the lower range of the lower bound of this range as a threshold under the distribution to estimate the probability of inadequacy. Now, for some nutrients in which there is no variability, so an individual is either requires or not, I don't know, vitamin uh, B, I don't know, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm talking about, but in some cases, this range of variability is negligible. So, in that case, referring to the average requirement would not be a mistake because the average requirement is also the requirement of each individual. But whenever there is variability requirement, we need to control for it. And now, this is one point I wanted to make. The MDER is a parameter that is not the lowest possible level of energy requirement in the group. Because otherwise, if in a household there is an infant that has a requirement of 200 calories per day, the minimum would be 200, it's silly. So I want to show you just a figure to give you a sense. This is an empirical distribution of energy requirement in a simulated population that I have created. And the minimum better energy requirement for this situation is here. So I'm, I'm drawing this just to make you uh, have an idea of what is the MDR telling. The MDR is a weighted average of the energy requirement of each individual in the population, in the group, 
comfortable with healthy and active life, and we, that takes into consideration the composition of the group. So in this population, for example, in which there are people of different age, physical activity level, etc., the result is a level not of zero calories. In the population, there is still somebody with very, very low requirement, but it's a weighted average of the normative uh, consideration, including allowances for pregnancy, for uh, growth, <coughs> etc. So, once we have the probability distribution model and the normative threshold, we simply estimate the probability of undernourishment as the probability mass under the distribution below the MDR. If I wanted to describe it in words, this estimate is the probability that if I randomly select one member of this population and I observe his specific consumption and requirement, I found a requirement lower, uh, consumption lower than required. So it's not saying that what is the probability that I find somebody eating less than 1,932 calories. Okay? And this, I think, has been the most difficult concept to explain and to, and to grasp. So, just as a way of summarizing, when we interpret the FL method, we should keep in mind that the probability distribution function is not the empirical distribution of food consumption in the population. Even though it looks like a, a, a density that could replicate a histogram, is not. It's a different statistical model. The unit is the average individual, which summarizes the characteristic of the population in terms of sex, age, structure, uh, physical activity level, and body mass. The method is not a head count approach. And that is probably the most critical aspect. Even though we can estimate the percentage of people who are undernourished in a population, the method doesn't allow us to identify who the undernourished are. So we cannot use this method to identify within a household who is undernourished, or within a, a region which part of the population, because we don't have the necessary information. If we have that information, we should do it. This information of the link between the percentage of undernourishment and the possible determinants, the reasons why in a certain group there is 20% of undernourishment, needs to be studied by using external information, additional information, but cannot be inferred from the food consumption observation alone. Third point, the reliability of the estimates crucially depends on the quality and completeness of the data that we use. <coughs> we need to have information on the distribution of food consumption across units. We need to have information on the composition of the population by, with respect to all characteristics that are relevant for the requirement, sex, age, ideal body mass, physical activity level. There is one component which is related to the metabolic efficiency of a body that we will never know. So I would say that there will always be one component of the variability requirement because you can have even two identical twins engaged in the same <coughs> activity level which might have a slightly different metabolic efficiency. So the requirement will be different. So, Theoretically, we know these things, but in practice, we will never have the kind of information that we would need to do a 
help the town to face a problem. I would like to end this presentation now by summarizing its two main messages. First, I believe that we should conclude that despite problems that may exist with data, the FAO method, which uses a statistical model to estimate the probability that habitual caloric intake of the populations represented the individual is below the minimum dietary energy requirement, is indeed the most correct and statistically valid method to estimate the prevalence of dietary energy consumption in adequacy, that is, the caloric undernourishment in a population. Second, in the context of monitoring target 2.1 of the new Sustainable Development Goal Agenda, national statistical systems in all countries should incorporate an estimate of the prevalence of undernourishment both at national and sub-national level within their monitoring systems. Doing so, however, would require not only the collection of reliable data through household consumption surveys, which is something that India already does quite well, but also to adapt whatever estimation methodology they use to a proper international standard. And we suggest using the FAO method. It is imperative, though, that the method is implemented correctly. Thank you.